We're about five minutes late starting. Uh, I was waiting for Dean Colson, but uh, he's up. He's in, uh, involved in uh, uh, trustee orientation upstairs. So um, I'd like to call the facilities committee to order. And uh, Mikey, would you call the roll, please? Yes, Mr. Martin. Here. Mr. Perez. Present. Mr. Stavros. Mr. Temple. Here. Dr. Yost. Here. Uh, Mr. Feard, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. Um, uh, this meeting today, we're going we're gonna to talk about a few things, and I'd like to kind of give you a, a summary of what, what we're going to do today. Uh, first of all, we're going to talk about PICO. Uh, as everybody in the room probably knows, it's not getting better. It's getting a little worse, and I'll let Chris walk us through the details. Um, we also uh, got a letter from the governor this uh, last week which, uh, where he's asked our system and the system, education system to uh, – uh, consider giving back a couple, $250 million of PICO funds. So uh, we'll visit about that a little bit. We've got one bond issue to approve with the University of Florida. Uh, we will hear an energy, re energy report, and uh, we'll look at some projects that have been completed in the last few years. So with that, um, I'd like to call on uh, Chris to um, – to uh, talk about the fixed capital aid outlay uh, situation, the budget with PICO. Thanks. Chris? Thank you very much, Mr. Beard, members of the committee, board members. Um, yes, as you know, that we've had this discussion as committee about PICO now at least three times. This will be the fourth where we've really focused in on the issues surrounding PICO and the decline. And as you've mentioned, the situation has not gotten better. In fact, it's gotten considerably worse. At our last board meeting in November, the estimate for PICO for the upcoming year was $113 million for a K-12 system. We said, well, how will we be able to um, get by with that? The most recent estimate, and I'll talk about that first before we talk about the governor's letter, the conference met on last Friday, Friday the 13th, and they reduced the estimate for the two upcoming years to absolute zero. So 12-13 is zero on a K through 20 basis, of course, including the state university system. The projection for 13-14 is also a zero with finally some capacity returning again three years from now in 14-15. What the conference adopted was a, the zero budget, the thought was there is a deficit in the, the trust fund. It's somewhere between 200 and $250 million. What the conference seems to be putting forward to say, well, we will not have any appropriations for the two forthcoming years. Those new monies will be used to satisfy these old projects. So that's how they would address the deficit, by no further appropriations. Of course, the conference has no authority to appropriate or take any other action. It's just a revenue estimating conference. How that relates to the governor's letter is the governor has asked the boards, the state board and board of governors, to see if they could come up with cuts of up to 250 to, again, address that same deficit. The deficit is caused primarily by the fact that declining revenues mean that the state of Florida can no longer bond PICO revenues. It has a minimum coverage ratio, 90%. It's a 1.1 cover. We don't hit that coverage anymore. So that last bit, the 250 that the legislature, the legislature authorized several years ago, cannot be used at the moment. It's, it's not a matter of a policy decision. It's a matter that PICO is a constitutional program. That's the cap. So that's some context. Now, if I may, I'd like to um, give the committee some context just in general dollar terms. I know today the committee doesn't plan to take any action, but I want to provide with your direction, um, Mr. Chair, just some context of what is outstanding K through 20. So outstanding K through 20, these are all the appropriations that have been made on a K through 20 basis. And when I say that, you know, this is for charter schools, Division of Blind Services, School for Deaf and Blind, Public Broadcasting, 
um, elementary and secondary, or the K-12 system, the state college system, and our system, the state university system. So all delivery systems, public delivery systems, there's a total outstanding undispersed balance of $705 million. That was as of a couple of weeks ago. Obviously, there's ongoing projects, and Department of Education continues to make payments on those projects that are currently underway. So that balance will continue to decline. So of that 705, that is what we're being asked to take away from, approximately 250. So uh, roughly a third. We're looking to make a third, a 30 percent cut of previous appropriations. That's what the ask is. So then for our system, what does that mean to our system? We have an undispersed balance of about $363 million. Most, um, 85 million of that is in maintenance funding. The balance of that is in projects, so $280 million in major projects. Of that, um, some, many are under construction. Most, if not all, are imminently going to construction in the next 60 days to six months. So that's sort of the universe that we're talking about. I can also let the board know the actions that the chancellor has taken already in response to the governor's request to allow this committee and the board to be as responsible as possible. First was the day after the request was received by the board, Department of Education and the chancellor, the commissioner and the chancellor sent out a memo to all the institutions asking them to not sign any new contracts, immediate, effective immediately until the situation could be resolved. We did also in that letter indicate the Department of Education would continue to honor payments, pay requests for the ongoing projects, so that, but just no new contracts could be signed, so that we could sort of, until the situation could be resolved. And then yesterday, again, we've been working jointly with Department of Education and a memo went out from the two CFOs of the two entities to the institutions. We have to provide detailed information on each and every project that still has an undispersed balance so that we could have information on in what phase the project is in, exactly when it went under contract, if it's going, you know, if it's under contract but not yet going to construction, what's the estimated date to go to construction, mobilization information, about 12 columns worth of information so that the, this board and the state board could have all the available data and the House and Senate staff and the governor's office could have all available data on these projects. I believe when we get that back, we'll find, as I said, almost every project is either already under construction, underway, and of course I, I can't see any policy board stopping a project that's half built because that's just not a good use of resources. And even the projects, if it's under contract and the, con the contractor has mobilized their crew and they're ready to show up in a couple of weeks, I think that's also very challenging for this board. But we will be gathering that information. The date we've been asked to respond to the governor's letter is February 7th. I hope we can, you know, have all the information back from the universities by that time. But we're doing our very best with that, you know, very challenging request. And I'd be glad to talk further, take any questions, whatever yeah, the pleasure any questions? I, is. I mean, my, my sense is that uh, we'll have an awful lot more to, to look at and deal with uh, by the next meeting. Uh, it's really too early in, in, in the process for, for this committee and this board to, to take any action any, uh, one way or another, uh, particularly since we've got uh, multiple systems involved and we don't know how the pro ratas of of all this will turn out. Yes, sir. Uh, Is there any way to, to get a handle on, let's say, what the maintenance part of it's going to be for the next two or three years? I mean, it seems to me that figures in here someplace. Is that right, Chris? Yeah, we, we, we know what the undispersed balance is is for maintenance institution by institution. That's that's all within that $85 million. I think oh, okay. that the challenge on that for the institutions becomes if you look out in the future and see for the next two years that you're going to get no additional funding, what do you do? Do you try to do, say, a normal maintenance repair that's due, a roof replacement, 
Or since you know you're getting nothing else, do you hold every dime and wait, just only do catastrophic emergency repairs? So th I think that's one reason we have such a large balance now, that we're just holding on to every dime, you know, hoping to avoid the worst, hoping to avoid hurricanes, that type of thing. Chris, a any other questions? Tico. Mr. Chair, I guess I want to know the procedure from here. We're going to send out the survey. We're going to get back this data. Um, I would be hesitant to just forward data. I presume this board is going to make a recommendation as to which ones we can or which ones we suggest returning funds to. I know it's an uncomfortable conversation for all of us, but I'd rather we do it than say, here's our data, y'all pick and choose. Yeah, my sense is once we fully understand the status of all the projects, then we can start making some yeah. sort of uh, recommendation. My concern is then if the governor wants it by February what, Chris? Seventh. Seventh. We don't meet between then and now. Um, and I think we ought to at least chat by phone or something so that we can have some recommendations in place um, before we turn over that raw data or that raw data is going to become a, a force of its own and, and I right. think we're going to be out of the loop. Well, I, uh, I, I agree to some degree that uh, we ought to uh, have a conversation once we have the information. The, 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 the big problem is when are we going to have the information, Chris? Um, we've asked for the institutions to return it by the close of business, I believe, February 25th. And January? so January? I would say no, we February 25th. February 20. No, excuse me. January. January 25th. And so just in the course of things, making sure everything is submitted properly and we can, you know, read the files, um, we should have something put together by the next day is what I'd imagine, 26th okay. or the 27th. I don't know what day of the week that is. I would think we'd want a conference call of some sort, Mr. Chairman, um, to talk about whatever that data looks like. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, what's your sense of this? I apologize for being no, late, no, but I was working. I, I know you were. I wasn't having fun. Um, no, I was having fun, but I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, told them, we, told, we told everybody where you were. Uh, um, as I understand it, the governor has the right to require re reversion, reverter, of a limited amount of these projects. Um, only those projects which are 31 months old and haven't been and the money hasn't been spent. Is that right, Chris? Yeah, that's exactly correct. There's a there's a 31 month reversion process that's statutory, and the governor has put out the guidelines that he'll use, you know, in evaluating the the projects. Um, typically, say for example, last year, and we have the same guidelines this year, we don't revert, and we didn't revert any projects last year. We typically revert just pennies on the dollar. It's usually very small. And so, all the other money that does isn't 31 month 31 months old can be reverted only if the legislature agrees with that right that's correct the historical guidelines have been if the funding is it's if it's less than 31 months old it's not subject to reversion if it's greater than 31 months say for example the guidelines have said if it's land acquisition funds and we have a couple of land acquisition projects those aren't sub the guidelines have said those aren't subject to reversion. Now, the governor could change the guidelines and broaden what's subject to reversion, but to date, he has not done so. So I think this requires a communication not only with the governor's office, but with the House and Senate as well as, as part of all this. I certainly don't disagree with that, Mr. Chair. I just want to make sure that we've been asked for a recommendation and that we actually make a recommendation, not just provide raw data. I understand. Any other discussion? All right. Thank you, Chris, for that. And uh, this is not an easy uh, issue to deal with. And I think we need to really understand the the uh, playing field before we go making uh, decisions on on what what uh, what it may look like. Um, <clears throat> okay, Chris. Um, uh, Let's see, I keep my, my iPad keeps going off. Um, okay, next on the list is a bond re resolution uh, uh, with the Board of Governors authorizing the division of bond finance of the state 
Board of Administration of Florida to issue debt on behalf of the University of Florida to finance the construction of a student residence on the main campus of the University of Florida. Chris. Yes. Um, the University of Florida has submitted a proposal for financing renovations to several existing residential facilities God, on its main campus. And it ha in the materials on page 9, it lists all the different upgrades and updates to the different residence halls at the University of Florida. So it's not adding any new space, just renovating existing dormitory space. Um, the total project cost is expected to be $27.5 million. Um, the proposal from the university has been reviewed by us and the division. It's in conformity with the board debt guidelines in Florida statute 101062 and staff recommends adoption. All in favor? Aye. Thank you, Chris. Um, next uh, on the agenda is the energy report. Okay. Um, last year, the, the members of the committee re recall, there was proviso that required higher education to develop uh, annual energy report. And I believe the committee was pleased with that. It looked at three years of comparative data, looking to see what reductions we had made both to cost and to consumption of energy. So the committee, as part of its annual work plan, asked us to request the university to provide this information again. What's, I'll go over just a few slides now for the committee. We do have the complete report. We have not yet posted it to the website. We're waiting to this committee meeting. But that will be available. I think that was helpful information, particular to the institution, so they could sort of compare themselves to each other, knowing it's in many cases, an apples to oranges comparison, but it's still very helpful data and gives a general sense of the, you know, how do we, how are we doing on a national basis? So first, looking at our summary, on the bottom line, you can see that from 07 to 08, costs themselves increased from a little less than 150 million dollars as a system. They increased the next year to 160. Then they declined to about that same level in 9-10. This year, with good news, our actual energy cost over that four-year time horizon are actually 3% less than they were in 07-08. So as a system, we're actually, you know, bottom line, spending less money on utilities than we were four years ago. And I think that's pretty, a well, pretty that remarkable that, achievement. Yeah, and that includes new buildings, too. That includes new buildings, additional students, additional space. And I have a couple of slides on that. Here is just the rough mixture. I know this is awfully small. Um, but it shows the see. relatively share of each institution. Obviously, the big green chunk in the lower quadrant, that's the University of Florida. I can't make out any of the rest myself. But what you can see is we've increased our campus gross square footage by about 6%. Again, over that four-year period, it's gone from 65 million square feet to 71 million square feet. So a 6% increase in our space while decreasing our absolute cost. Um, a summary just on um, consumption, we actually are consuming more in utilities, which is not surprising considering that we have increased our space and we've increased the number of students. It's been a 4% increase on the British thermal units, which is the standard measure on this. It's a little bit out of my depth on that. But what I want to say is, well, you might ask, how have we done that? It's really by lowering, we've increased the consumption, how we lower the cost. Some of it is through self-generation. I mean, you'll recall earlier in the year we talked about Florida Gulf Coast and their solar field. So they were doing some self-generation. Um, some institutions have shifted towards more off-peak usage. And just by generally becoming more efficient, we've been able to reduce our cost while still increasing our consumption of energy. And then our final side, we're becoming more efficient, the energy performance index and Governor Long, I know you had a particular interest in this and I hope I'm stating this correctly, but this is the national standard or one of the national standards, the EPI, which is just how efficient we are on a square footage basis. And you can see over the past four years again, we've had a 5% decrease in our EPI. 
So in terms of what we can control from a, a cost saving standpoint, the physical plant people can't control how much space we add to the system and they certainly can't control the number of students and how heavily our facilities are used, but they can make sure what we do have is more efficient. So that's just some summary information for the board and I'd be glad to take any questions on that report. It looks to me like it's uh, great progress, Chris. Thank you. Is there, a, is there a national EPI average that would tell us how we compete against the rest of the country? Um, I'm sure, sure there's weather variance and everything else that would make it not a consistent. I, I'm sure there is, but I don't have that. But I can I can get that for you, Governor Perez. It's curious. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Chris, could I ask you to go back and sure. uh, deal with the UCF housing uh, uh, situation that's uh, for information for us, I guess. But uh, Yes, please. I'd be very glad to do that, and um, um, forgive me on that, skipping over that. Um, we had a one bit of good news. I know we had a lot of bad news on the PICO front. One bit of very good news today, um, as, you, as the board approves these bond resolutions asking the Division of Bond Finance to let bonds on various projects such as the UF one today, we've approved several series of bonds. Today, the UCF housing and UCF parking was approved by governor and cabinet. That's the first dorm and parking deal that has been approved by this board in well over a year. So I think that's a very good sign that these transactions that are being you know, vetted by this board, approved by this board, will move forward and construct needed residential and parking facilities, you know, at our institutions for those that don't, you know, go out, you know, do separate DSO type issues. Um, in connection with that, um, there's a consent item back further in the package for the UCF housing. UCF added some Greek housing to its housing system and going through the due diligence, bond finance found that this board never officially authorized those additional beds into the system. There are revenue for the um, housing system at UCF and our part of their system, but just across the legal T's and dot the I's, they had request could this board approve the addition of those additional few beds to the UCF housing system. Right, but it's on the consent, so we it's don't need to take a mo make a motion yeah, here. Yes, yes, sir. Right, thank you. Um, I guess the final part of our report is the completion project report. Uh, yes, sir, and if I can get some help from the Technical Mr. People. Giuliano there because I can't actually see those little <laughs> tiny icons. I can't see any. While he's doing that, let me give you some just summary statistics on these facilities. Bear with me a second. We had 25 total projects for the past calendar year that were completed. They totaled $618 million. And I know that, you know, as we go through these projects, some may think, well, as a system, we must be in pretty great shape. Almost every institution got a facility or two. We see projects from all types of funding sources. It's hard to believe that, you know, maybe two or three years from now, we'll be looking at a much, much reduced list. But that's the message I have for this committee today. Many of these projects have been years in the works. We, I look back at some of them. Original planning money on some of these projects was back over 10 years ago. So these are very much long-term in the works projects. One of the reasons we have so many projects is we did have some very good years three or four years ago. Now those projects are coming in, which is terrific for our system. But as we see these projects aren't being replaced by new money, and in fact, we're under the potential of losing significant dollars. You know, this completed projects report for 2012 and especially 2013 and 2014 will be much reduced. And on each slide, it indicates the funding source. Um, we had on these slides, there's 11 PICO projects. There's five bond projects. There's three or four of the old Cortellis projects representing the last few years of that program and then some mixed funding projects of that total five. So just as you can imagine, each project that says PICO, that may not be there in a few years. So those projects won't be coming forward, won't be coming out of the ground. 
and the Cortellus projects, as we know, those definitely will not be coming out of the ground because that has, they haven't been funded in several years. So just please keep that in mind as we go through this. And as usual, we'll start with the smallest facility, and this is for FSU. It's a little over $2 million. I, again, I apologize for being so small, but um, this is a new gallery that's been added to the Ringling Museum at, at the Sarasota campus of FSU. Um, for University of North Florida, this project happened very quickly. This was an annex added to the University of North Florida education building. This is a disability and veteran stop. It's like a one-stop shop for veteran services um, within the College of Education. And this was um, just recently added to, the, to that facility. Um, at the University of West Florida, some significant renovations were made to their natatorium. It says it was for no academic program. It's actually for their physical education and gymnastics program. Actually, this is a huge pool and it had a severe leak and it was a huge you know, waste of resources and funds. So they did quite a bit of unseen work to stop the leak and um, make sure the, pro the, the facility was efficient. At UCF, this is their International Reading Center and I want to make sure, that, again, this is an annex to the existing education building because you could look at the cost which is a little over $5 million and say, wow, how do they build so much facility for $5 million? That's just basically one wing added to an existing facility. And this services to promote reading on an international basis and try to figure out, you know, what are the barriers to reading internationally? Um, USF, again, this is a blend of fund sources. It had some donation, it had some PICO, it had some, um, um, bond money, the College of Medicine, and Dr. Wilcox, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe for several years has asked for significant PICO dollars to completely renovate the existing um, College of Medicine. This goes back to the years when we were looking to expand our medical school programs as a system, and even then USF was looking to can do these renovations. We've never been able to fund that request from PICO but USF has been able to do the most vitally needed renovations to the facility. So that's what this is to the, to the tune of some $7 million from a variety of funds. Um, again, Florida State, this was a challenge grant program, um, an expansion to the um, Tibbles Learning Center, the Circus Museum there at Ringling. And again, I always have to say it's, it's a beautiful thing to visit if you're ever in that area. Or maybe when we go to New College, I think, in the upcoming year. Um, for USF, their Morsani Center, this was a finance bonded program and they were able to use this to fit out and complete the fifth and sixth floors of the Morsani Center. Um, we just were at Florida Atlantic. This is that highway that runs right in front of the stadium and the housing and this was a $9 million PICO infrastructure program that was very critical to FAU and sort of allowed them to redirect the loop road and connect to the back exit of the university. Um, for New College, they have not had a facility on the list in several years. This is the first new major academic facility at New College in, in many years, and this is very important to the institution. Um, uh, Florida A&M, the Jones Hall renovation, I just saw this earlier today with um, Committee Chair Beard, and this was some PICO funding renovating a facility. I forget, how old did they say that facility was? Was it from the 30s? It was the a, yeah, 40s? It was and yeah. it was well in need of rent. This is their main science building at FAMU. Sampson and Young Halls, again, saw those today as well. The board approved the bonds on these a couple of years ago. These are two historical facilities at the institution. They were just opened on time and on budget this fall. They're um, fully occupied and, and very nice facilities, and I found out today Dr. Ammons actually lived in Young Hall, so we didn't, we didn't point that out when we were approving this. <laughs> but, the, but those are the old type uh, dorms, not uh, what, yeah. what the university system's building yeah. today in other areas, so. very much but they so. are very nice and well done. Okay, now we start to move into the more, the larger projects in terms of dollars. For the University of Florida, this is their innovation hub, which promotes commercialization, 
incubator startups. This is just located just off the main campus at the University of Florida. Um, again, for Florida S State University, this is the old First District Court of Appeals, now being called the Advocacy Center, and this was annexed into the College of Law. So it was an existing facility, remodeled, renovated to serve the university right here in Tallahassee. Um, UCF, this is another bonded project, parking garage six, just completed. Um, University of South Florida, a wellness center. This was funded from a combination of different sources, but including some CITF bonds. So the last CITF issue was in 2008. So again, this is sort of the tail end of the CITF funding. FAU, the research lab, this is at Harbor Branch. A few years ago, again, there was a significant appropriation, PICO appropriation to Harbor Branch, and they've built this wonderful new laboratory facility there. Um, this is a research building for Florida State. I'm proud I can say it's the Aero Propulsion Mechatronics and Energy Building, and I think it has something to do with artificial intelligence, and it's top secret, so I'll pretend I know more about it. This is a very important facility, if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Barron, correct, for FSU. Partially funded from PICO, partially funded from sponsored research, research dollars. Um, FIU, I sure wish this was a much bigger picture. If you can see, it's sort of a wedge-shaped, and it's just an amazing facility. Maybe I can get a larger slide for the committee, you know, later on today or tomorrow. Um, but this house has several other programs um, in international social work, se several other programs. We're coming to the end. A dormitory for FSU, Wildwood Halls, phase two. Um, athletic improvements for USF. This is several facilities, including their um, softball and baseball complex, football practice field, tennis center, um, several other parts of the complex. Um, the music building for the University of South Florida, this is a state-of-the-art, uh, world-class music facility, and it replaces several outdated, kind of scattered-about campus facilities for USF. Um, the Johnston Hall renovation, I think this is ver a very remarkable, this is like an 80-year-old facility at FSU. It's been all kinds of things over its life, um, a dining hall, academic space, administrative space. It's been completely renovated. They added a floor to it. It says the source of funds is FCO. It's actually a PICO-funded facility. I think this is a great example of how you can take an old facility renovate it, make it um, a, new, a new and function facility while still keeping that historic facade. Um, we all saw the stadium last month at FAU. Um, the interdisciplinary facility at USF, $80 million PICO funded facility just opened. This I believe initially was funded back in 2000. It takes a long time, even when times were good, it took, took a long time to accumulate $80 million. There's still parts of this facility interior that need to be completed because PICO fell short, but USF went ahead and built with what they had, knowing there's still some room to grow. And you would think this is our biggest facility, its biggest PICO facility, but no, FAU again, Innovation Village Apartments across the street from the stadium, and again from bonds. And I do believe that you know, as time goes on, without additional PICO money, we'll see more and more of the bond-funded projects and obviously less and less from PICO. And again, I apologize for the smallness of the screen and um, be glad to take any questions. Any questions from the committee? Thank you, Chris. That was very well done. Uh, that was the last item on our, on our committee meeting uh, agenda. Uh, I'd just like to say that this PICO uh, funding issue uh, may not be a crisis now, but if it continues, it will be. Um, as Chris said, we've got about $80 million in, in maintenance money still, that hadn't been spent, so we may be able to make it a year or two maintenance-wise and keep the roofs and all that uh, in place. But if we're going to meet our strategic plan that we work so hard on and grow the system, we can't do it without education buildings, which is what PICO uh, funds. So. 
I know that the House and Senate are working on f trying to find some kind of substitute for these funds, uh, even on an interim basis. I don't know if they've got any money to do it, but uh, it's going to take this board working with them and the governor to try to find a way to get from where we are to where we need to go. So with that, uh, any questions? Yes, sir. Dr. Temple. Mr. Yeah, Temple. I'd like to go back to the <laughs> first one again. And I don't know who this question is to, but so the governor says we have to have a report out that what prioritizes our up to 250 million or something of cuts. Well, what the 250 mean? million of cuts includes our system and, and, the, and, uh, the, and the board of K, education system, K through 12, K through 12 right. and the college system. So then how do, and then the legislature says they might say we're not cutting anything, right? So then how to, I mean, but we have to respond on by. February 7th? I mean, February it sounds... <laughs> Feb February 7th is the date that we've been requested to try to respond. Both boards have been asked to respond by that, by that date to the governor's office. There is, uh, Governor, a $250 million request of the governor. Right. We I all, saw I read it. All three yeah. go into the delivery systems and find $250 million of projects to put our share of that, whatever that, by the way, is determined to be. There's no <coughs> parameters on it on the table for consideration for return. Um, before we even interface with the other systems, uh, we decided the best approach to take would be to inventory our rolling stock, find out what's out there, and then ultimately come back and see what we might put on the table. Your other point, though, is valid, and that is this is a governor's request. How the House and Senate want to handle PICO going forward is still anybody's guess. So we've got uh, one request that we're going to have to honor by uh, first week in February, and we're still waiting to hear how the House and Senate might want to address the issue of PICO. So, so the first, that remains to be seen. As I call it, the first food fight is between K through 12 and SUS. Is that right? <laughs> K through 12, state college system, so, and, and, and SUS. SUS right? Three parties. Three parties. So that's the first food fight. And then the second food fight is, if once you get through that, is how do we what prioritize ours, right. right? And and we got to get all that done by February seventh. Wow. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Yes. Sir. <laughs> yeah, you got it. <laughs> you got it. Yes, sir. <coughs> Can't shake this thing. Yeah, me neither. I wonder if it wouldn't be appropriate for your committee to really think long term and try to understand on a global basis in the United States how other university systems are funding uh, their capital construction because I, I, I think it's, you know, we're only waiting for the inevitable and, and I think if we would get up and running so we understood what the alternatives are, uh, whether it has, you know, it may, I hate to say it, may have to come out of tuition. Yeah. You know, there may be other, other sources that we're going to have to start doing. But I think as a system, maybe this committee ought to start that process and understand what the alternatives are. So if it does go away, we're prepared to go forward with the legislature and others and seek the remedies that we think will keep our system strong. Yeah, I, 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 would, uh, I, would, I would like to do that. And uh, uh, Chris, uh, I'd like for the staff to be directed to do some of the research that uh, the other systems are going, and I think at a, a pretty high level, and then we can start looking at it. Because I agree, that not every state has PICO funds. They do it some other way. And, uh, but our tuition is so low, and their tuition is dramatically higher. And if they're using tuition to do it, maybe that's why we're trying to get to that average. I don't know that, that question, answer, but uh, sure. yes, sir. I, I also believe, as do others, that regardless of how this is reconciled, this issue of PICO, revenue streams, et cetera, that we're probably never going to get back to where we were before, not only in terms of sheer volume, but the process. Because it's a chicken or the egg. You know, we, we had some pretty good years on PICO. Uh, the revenue was there. I think under any set of circumstances, one of the things we're going to have to do going forward is to also reconsider our process. And I think there's going to have to be greater attention paid to academic 
program alignment with new construction requests. It isn't that we've disregarded that, we haven't, but I think it's going to have to be tied together ever more closely than ever to make sure when new programs, for example, are, are requested to be added, that the facilities piece be dropped in immediately. Uh, because if you add, uh, theoretically, if you add more people because you've increased your programs, you have to have places to put people. And more often than not, it's specialized construction based on the needs of the program. And we've had some pretty good years where we knew the construction potential would be there. Uh, I don't know about that anymore, and I think we're going to have to really more closely and thoughtfully align uh, program requests with uh, construction needs, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, and, and again, the strategic plan has us growing pretty dramatically in the next 20 years, and uh, we can't do it without facilities. So we've got to find an answer, and quickly, I guess. So if you would uh, proceed with that report, that would be helpful, Chris. And yes, sir. Mr. Chair, I, I, I'm not too sure whether it's a crisis or what's happening, but basically what we're looking at is a five-year period of time now, given the prior three years and the next two, when we right. will not have had PICO funding right. uh, to speak of. And uh, given how you know, we tend to operate, we could be looking at, a, at basically a, what could amount to a 10-year drought between uh, when we have funding and when we actually get new buildings on the ground, even if we were to figure this out uh, over nice the next topic. 18 months. Right. So I'd like to appeal to the board for a sense of urgency on this matter. In right. my mind, it could be one of the largest, the, the most significant strategic challenge that, that, that our entire system will face. I know the chancellor has identified this as a major you know, opportunity for us to maybe reinvent ourselves, uh, and I'd look forward to working with you on this. Great. Thank you for that. I agree. Any other comments? Questions? The facility committee is closed. <laughs>